Great. Um, so I'm Venkateshan, and uh, I'm a data scientist at uh, Swiggy. Uh, those of you who got a chance to attend the last session by Nitin um, probably have an understanding of the way in which uh, recommendation systems work at Swiggy and how relevance and ranking is being done. What I'm going to talk about is sort of the other side of things, um, the delivery system, like how do orders get delivered, what are the issues that are being faced. The topic is serviceability under high demand, which refers to the need, the requirement to maintain reasonable serviceability even when the customer demands are high. Okay, okay so I'm sure most of you here are familiar with how uh, Swiggy works. It's basically an online on-demand platform where the customer orders food from the restaurant subsequent to which a delivery agent is assigned to the order, who goes to the restaurant and waits for the order to get prepared if it already hasn't been, picks it up, and then delivers it to the customer. That's the order cycle. Okay. <clears throat> now imagine what um, the ideal scenario for an on-demand company, on-demand delivery company like Swiggy would be. Uh, to make things a little bit more definite, imagine there were infinite resources both unlimited on-demand delivery fleet, as well as complete information about the future. Let's not discount that. Complete information about the future, right? Then uh, we would be able to service, we would ideally like to be able to service any customer ordering from any restaurant at any time of the day, in any situation, rain or shine, thunderstorm, snow, doesn't matter, in any, in any um, you know, in any sort of, patterns, the other pat unpredictable patterns like traffic, and promise a reasonable amount of time for delivery and ensure that the order gets delivered within that promised time. Right? That's sort of the ideal thing that we would hope for. Right? Um, unfortunately, we have to deal with real-world constraints. Right? We have a finite delivery fleet. Um, we have unpredictable scenarios, like I hinted, bad weather or a competitor server is down, which uh, leads to a spike in uh, customer demand to our platform. Um, even on normal times, leave out bad weather, even normal times, the customer demand is significantly uh, variable. And so are restaurant preparation times. Part of it is because like restaurant preparation times aren't carefully instrumented. And also because um, like restaurants don't provide clear information about, say, how much time they require to um, uh, to prepare a particular type of dish. Right? Uh, in addition, you also have um, variations uh, coming from the actual delivery agent for the same, say, restaurant customer pair, because a delivery agent who's more familiar with the neighborhood would be able to take shortcuts and get to the destination earlier. And this happens sort of more often than you might think. And even if it's not really shortcuts, like if you're just more familiar with the neighborhood, I'm sure from your own experience of like getting from point A to point B, if you're just more familiar, you'd sort of know, say, which lane to be on and stuff, right? So it just makes things different. So there's significant variability coming there as well. And then the fleet itself is only partially on demand. I mean, if, if we know in advance that we need something, say, a week, uh, a week in advance, then yes, we can probably get there or get very close to that. But then if I need like a sudden surge in, say, the delivery fleet in the next half an hour, the chances of actually reaching the target are quite slim. Okay, so it's partially on demand. Now, <clears throat> what are some ways in which um, so we can address these real-world constraints? Now, I'm just going to go through um, every one of them. Uh, they're going to sound a bit disconnected, okay? And I'll sort of expand on them as we go along. And hopefully, at the end of the talk, you'll be able to see how these things sort of tie together. But here, I'll just very briefly describe them. Um, the first step here is, of course, that uh, you know we're talking about situations of stress. We're talking about situations of high demand. But we need to sort of quantify that, preferably with a single metric, quantify the load on the delivery system. Right? That's like the first thing. Then um, we can represent at any given time um, the undelivered orders, the orders that have, ex that have entered into the system, the orders that we've accepted, orders we're obligated to fulfill but we haven't delivered yet, treat the undelivered orders as a queue. And um, just as any other queuing thing, you have an inflow and outflow. You have new orders coming in and you have an outflow of orders, which is basically the orders getting delivered. Right? So you use queuing model abstractions on top of that. 
And then, of course, as you can all imagine, and I kept referring to it earlier as well, you need predictive models. Predictive models everywhere. Predictive models for the orders that are going to come in, say, in the next 10 minutes of time. Predictive models for the preparation time of the restaurant. Predictive models for, say, the time it takes for the delivery agent to go from uh, pick up the order from the restaurant uh, and actually delivering it to the customer. Okay. So um, we also need real-time strategies to reduce demand. That's the whole point. So we have serviceability, and you have demand and you want to sort of reduce the demand. And which, uh, with everything else, we'll get into the details in a bit, right? But it's not just about reducing the demand. It's also about which, which as how should I reduce the orders? How can I allocate my demand? How can I shape my demand, right? Not all orders are created equal. Maybe I might want to prioritize certain orders based on, say, which restaurant or what the location of the customer is or what the location of the restaurant is. Right? So it's also about intelligent demand allocation. Okay. OK, now, so that, you know, you sort of, um, so that I can sort of intuitively formulate the problem statement. Uh, let's consider a somewhat hypothetical scenario. Let's say that uh, the orders could get arbitrarily delayed. Let's say I give my, ourselves, we give ourselves the permission for the orders to get arbitrarily delayed. Now, in principle, then, all incoming orders uh, can be accepted, and they can be delivered in due course. Now, the simple reason for this is because even if you consider, like, a uh, a peak time, like dinner, right? So imagine between um, 7 p.m. and 9.30 p.m., where there's going to be like a surge in demand. Eventually, the peak is going to, you're going to go past the peak, and the demand's going to come down, and then the, ba the orders that have been backed up over time will eventually get delivered, right, through the night. So you can certainly, in principle, deliver all the orders, right, if you, if you have the condition that you don't care about how delayed they get. Now, naturally, the problem is that uh, this creates a terrible customer experience because a lot of the orders are going to get delayed immensely. So, so when, you, when, I, when you put it in these terms, when I, when I structure it in these terms, then naturally the question then becomes that I want to take just as many orders real time, right? I need to make real time decisions about the number of orders I want to take in the next interval such that they get serviced reasonably. And like I said, also be smart about which specific demands to take, which specific orders to take. OK, so let's uh, just give you a sense of the difficulty involved in this thing. Um, so, so let me just point this out. Like I said, we need to limit the orders. That's clear. We need to somehow uh, uh, choke on the orders at some, at some level um, so that we can the ones that we accept, we can deliver with, within a reasonable time. Now, for the orders that we do accept, the question is what strategy to be used so that we can deliver it within the promised times. Right. So one, you want to limit orders so that the ones you take, you deliver it within the thing, promised times. And then once the order actually comes in, what strategy do you actually adopt so that that becomes a reality, right? Now, on a temporal axis, one proceeds to. You need to first get to one, the filtering stage, and then you get to two. But the solution to one depends on the solution to two. So if you were to think purely at an order level, in a certain sense, there's a circular dependency, and you can't actually even solve it. Right? Um, but that's only a theoretical thing. In reality, of course, you use approximations and assumptions. Specifically, you think in terms of averages, and you think in terms of fluctuations about the averages. You talk about, say, error margins, and how error margins um, will affect decision making. OK, so let's uh, study this thing that I talked about, um, the, the quantification of the load, right? What is the metric that captures a load on the delivery system? One straightforward metric is, uh, is what you see there. Um, yeah, so it's just, the, it's just the ratio of the number of undelivered orders divided by the number of delivery agents. I'll call it the stress ratio. Now, uh, before we sort of uh, study this a little bit further, it's intuitively appealing because um, if you keep the number of delivery agents constant and you increase the number of undelivered orders, you naturally expect that the system is under greater stress. Likewise, if your undelivered orders are kept constant and you increase the number of delivery agents, then um, the resources is better spread out. Right? 
I mean, the, the orders are better spread out among the resources. So you're under lesser stress. So it's kind of, it has an immediate intuitive appeal. Now, one very important thing is that everything that I'm going to talk about, everything that I have talked about, uh, and everything I am going to talk about deals with scenarios where S is greater than 1. We do certainly have situations where S is less than 1. But for all practical purposes, that's a trivial situation. When S is less than 1, in most cases, the serviceability is pretty good. We're able to get the orders in the, in the promised times. And yes, even there we can do optimization, we can improve, but the gains from that are much less. The real problem occurs when S is greater than 1. And most of the times when you're ordering at, at um, say, a uh, weekend dinner or even weekend lunch, you're talking about S significantly being greater than 1. Okay? And all the, everything else I'm going to talk about will concern that scenario. S less than 1, you can think of it as a trivial case. Okay. Okay, now we have, we have a stress factor. Let's also say that um, we somehow arrive at an S max, some threshold on the stress factor um, beyond which serviceability drops uh, below acceptable levels. Okay. Now, uh, let's, not, let's set aside the question of how we get to the S max. Let's just say that we have some S max for a given area. And uh, we want to make sure that S doesn't breach S max. Okay. So let's see how that can, uh, how we could possibly do that. I want to take a quick detour now to, um, to sort of queuing a model abstraction. It's really simple. It's, it's, it's just very straightforward. But uh, we'll be sort of referring back to this. Like I said, your undelivered orders kind of are, is the queue. Uh, that's the undelivered orders. Now consider an interval of time delta t, a short interval of time delta t, and let delta a be the number of orders coming in, and uh, delta b the number of orders getting delivered within that interval of time delta t. Okay. Now we change the number of undelivered orders is nothing but the inflow delta a minus the outflow delta b. Just simple arithmetic, right? So this is change equal to change in inflow, change in outflow. Right now. The problem is that we want the stress factor to remain under S max. So you can think of a situation where S is approaching S max. So that's when you want to like throttle the orders. Right? And, uh, but we need to be careful about what it is we are throttling and when we are throttling. Right? Say imagine that uh, there's a customer who has uh, spent a lot of time um, looking at the uh, home page, Wiki home page, browsing through the restaurants, finally decides on the restaurant and then consults with uh, four or five of his friends, comes with a bunch of items, and then adds it to the cart, and just about when he's about to make a payment, something flashes on the screen saying that the order cannot be processed because, say, all the delivery agents are busy. Right? It's a terrible customer experience. So the added problem is that you want to throttle the orders, but you don't want to throttle the orders when users are there just about to make the order. At least you want to minimize that. If you cannot completely eliminate it, you want, you want to really minimize that. So the thing then is that you want to apply this intervention, whatever your throttling intervention is, upstream, before you get to that state. You want to apply it preferably at listing. Right? It's much better that the customer didn't see the restaurant in the first place. Right? Then see the restaurant and then add items to the cart and then discover that, well, this order can't be processed. OK. So now let's, uh, let's kind of like, um, uh, you know, dive a little bit deeper into this thing. Okay. So imagine that you are at 90% of, of the S max, your threshold stress. You don't want to cross it. You're there at 90% of it. You want to do something. You want to take some real-time strategies, right? Now the thing is that how much orders do we, how much do we throttle the orders and for how long? And in general, this is quite a difficult question to answer. But uh, here are a few things, here are a few facts that will sort of help us uh, in terms of arriving at a solution or an approximate solution. The first is that when the delivery fleet is more or less constant, right, then the delivery rate is also almost fixed, is a constant. This can be kind of shown analytically, but also empirically you can see that this is true. And uh, you can think of that as some sort of quasi-static assumption that over the period of time, things are not changing so dramatically that your delivery rate is changing. Um, fact number two is that if order acceptance rate, um, the inflow, is equal to the delivery rate, outflow, 
then your stress levels don't change, which goes back to the queuing thing, right? Your undelivered orders is equal, change in undelivered orders is inflow minus outflow. If your inflow is equal to outflow, then your undelivered orders don't change, and you're assuming that in that quasi-static assumption, the delivery fleet doesn't change, and so your stress factor also stays the same. The fact three is that if you can actually predict, right, if I'm, if I'm here, right, and say this is at 8 p.m., and if I can predict what's gonna happen between 8, 8 p.m. and 8, 10 p.m. for that particular region, if I can specifically predict the number of unconstrained orders, and I know what I need to actually, how, what, how many orders I can take based on the delivery rate, because the delivery rate is fixed, determined purely a deterministic function of the, uh, on an average, deterministic function of the uh, fleet size. So I know how many orders I should accept in the next 10 minutes, and if I can predict the number of unconstrained orders, if, the unconstrained being that I didn't you know, intervene, I didn't use any strategy, then I know what fraction of the orders to accept. Okay, which sort of naturally brings us to demand prediction. Right. So predict the number of um, incoming orders in a rolling horizon of say 10 minutes. Um, and as you can imagine, the features that we would use are order rate in recent times, but also like the order rate at a similar time previous week. Right? Because if you look at the order rate, it's sort of gonna go like this. You know, it's gonna reach its peak and it's gonna, it's gonna, go, it's gonna decrease at say dinner peak or lunch peak or anything. This is, without even knowing any data, you sort of intuitively you can imagine that's gonna be true, more or less, right? So if you know, wanna know what's gonna happen between eight and eight, 10, you wanna know whether eight to eight, 10 is, is that point where it's still increasing on an average or it is at the point where you already crossed the peak and you're sort of going down. And of course, if you clearly have an tr established trend of going down at the point, then of course you probably may not need the historical data so much, but then if you wanna know where the, where the point of, uh, where the changes, the inflection is, then you certainly need to know the historical data. So you also use historical data at a similar time, in a similar zone in a previous week, maybe like a whole bunch of other several weeks put together. In addition, you also wanna know um, sort of what's the activity on the app um, or, the, or the browser or whatever platform people are using to order, right? You wanna know how many people are there enlisting, how many people are there in menu, because then um, these are the people that uh, will actually, um, well, the screen seems to have gone blank. Okay, so uh, while this is getting fixed, yeah. So you sort of wanna know like um, what, the, what the activity is, and then you take that also as a, as a feature and um, in order to predict the demand. Now, one crucial thing is this time T, right? I told you you wanna predict for the next interval of time 10 minutes. Um, and this is kind of a crucial thing. Now, there's a trade-off involved in this prediction of time t. Um, on the one hand, I want t to be large enough so that uh, the numbers, the raw numbers, are going to be higher. Simple thing, right? If, I, if I'm taking a longer time, more number of orders. So my error as a fraction of the number of orders is going to be smaller. The reason being that statistical fluctuations for larger numbers is going to be smaller. Some of you understand, say for instance, if you think of this as a Poisson process, then uh, if n is a number, then uh, the standard coefficient, um, standard deviation is root n. And so root n over n is one over square root of n. So as n becomes larger, your, your error as a fraction decreases. So you wanna keep t large so that your fractional error is smaller. But at the same time, we, w we wanna work under the quasi-static assumption. Right? So you don't want t to be large enough that the situation on the ground is completely changed. Specifically, the number of delivery agents has changed dramatically. Or that you have a new, uh, you have like, you know, sudden thunderstorms that um, you're encountering. Cool, so that's what, so, so T is kind of, there's a trade-off there over between how much, how accurate you want your predictions to be, and how much of your quasi-static assumption you sort of want to maintain, want to retain, right? And in general, it depends on the properties of the area. Now, so far I've told you like, um, you know, what have, I, what have we done so far? We've said that, yeah, we get modem orders, we have some stress factor, and we get a threshold for the stress factor. We don't want the S to cross, the stress factor to cross that threshold. And so we are kind of throttling the orders. And then we're throttling the orders by predicting what's gonna happen in the next 10 minutes and then sort of limiting uh, things at listing or which we will sort of discuss maybe in a little bit more detail. But now the question is, which orders do we actually limit? And which ones do we allow, right? Should we treat them all um, 
uh, you know, on equal footing. Now, um, you know, a standard approach, in, standard approach in these kinds of things is that you use some sort of a customer segmentation. You divide your customer base into sort of some set of segments, like based on, say, revenue, based on, like, loyalty, like the premium customers, the not so premium customers, the people who order frequently, the people who don't order frequently, whatever. You, you do that. Let's, it doesn't matter what exactly you do. You, you, you have now some set of segments, and then you reserve some set of slots based on your whatever calculations you did um, earlier. And then you say that you know, we allot, allocate that to the premium customers, uh, and then to the next category. And then when they fill up, you move on to the next one. And so that, that way, you sort of like prioritize um, your, um, your higher people who are higher up in the segment. That's one thing. Now, a problem here is that, um, like I said, we're talking here about errors, right? We're talking about errors in demand prediction. Now, if I were to implement something like this, it would also mean that I have to predict not just the total demand, I have to, I have to predict the probability, the, the composition probability of each of the segments in that upcoming demand. And because each of the composition itself is going to be smaller than the total, the fraction of errors are going to be greater in each. Right? So that's something to keep in mind. An alternative approach is that you just you make your decision purely based on the location of customers, specifically the restaurant customer distance. Let me, let me rephrase this. This is probably a little bit opaque. Let, let me rephrase this. Imagine you have a restaurant, right? And for every restaurant, there's a radius. There's a radius over which um, any customer who is within that radius can actually access that restaurant, can actually see that restaurant on the thing. What I'm talking about here is that you shrink the radius. And so you have two concentric um, circles um, with about the, about the restaurant. And so the, the customers who are sort of lying between those two consenting circles can no longer place the order. Now, naturally, depending on the distribution of customers, you, you're going to sort of throttle the demand because just because uh, based on how these are distributed as a function of the radius, you're going to have fewer and fewer customers actually going ahead and placing, placing the order. But then there's something else over here. There's something else that happens over here. So if you go back to the original queuing um, model abstraction, right? So you change delta n is equal to delta A minus delta B. Clearly, delta A is getting affected. You're reducing it. You're reducing the radii. Fewer people order. But there's something else. Now, from the restaurant's point of view, right, the average time it takes uh, for the restaurant to customer travel time has reduced. Because you've shrunk the radius, the average travel time is reduced. What this means is that the average cycle time has reduced. The average time between ordering and delivering has reduced which means your delivery efficiency, your delivery rate, your throughput increases, which means that this action not only reduces delta, it also increases delta B. So it, has a, it, it, it works at both ends. It decreases, it throttles the orders, at the same time it increases your delivery rate. And when you apply it to an entire area, this, this effect is actually, um, it's, it's actually really, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very much measurable. It's not just uh, sort of a, um, theoretical nicety, something that we can actually determine. Okay. Cool. Um, right. So, um, you know, we formulated the problem as uh, take as many orders as so that real time, take as many orders so that you can service them, right? That's kind of how I've, uh, we've gotten to this point. Um, but then, of course, we need to also understand um, what has been the um, loss in orders. We've applied some strategy and we've gotten to a point, but we also need to understand, estimate, how much has been the potential loss in orders to the counterfactual scenario where you didn't even um, impose such a strategy. Now, again, this, this problem is nothing but is equivalent to estimating the unconstrained order flow. Unconstrained order flow over that entire interval. Say you apply the strategy for two hours, right? And you have a certain order rate. You actually measure, but, and, but you want to know what would have been the unconstrained order rate had you not done anything. Now, in general, estimating that unconstrained order flow is, is quite difficult. Okay. Um, I don't want you to get confused between this unconstrained flow and what I talked about for the 10 minute interval. That unconstrained referred to the application of the strategy for the next 10 minutes. I'm talking here about you've applied a strategy and you're talking about the entire, the unconstrained order flow for the full interval of time. This is rather difficult to estimate. 
the problem is that even something like A-B testing um, is difficult because there's just way too many variables. Let me give you a more intuitive understanding of why this is difficult, right? Now, typically, what do you do with A-B testing? Say, for example, in this case, what would you like to do? You would ideally like to pick up another similar area, or you might want to pick up a similar day, a similar hour of time, or hours of time, or interval of time, and you want to look at how the order looks like. You don't apply any strategy. Then you look at, um, you apply a strategy on a different day, and you compare it. Leaving aside the fact that, you know, on the day that you don't apply a strategy, a lot of customers are going to get pissed off. Let's even let, let that slide. From purely from understanding, making a comparison, um, if you want to think of A-B testing, you want to have all the variables more or less similar. Right? And that's the standard understanding. Think about this. Here, your variables are not just things like, say, uh, some fixed set, finite set of things. You're talking about um, not just mere average. You're talking about a shape. You're talking about a curve, a trajectory for the order rate. You're talking about a trajectory for the number of delivery agents. Right? So for two things to be compared, your trajectories have to be similar, very similar. And they may not necessarily just depend upon some, say, F, F minus F prime uh, absolute values average. Right? It might also depend upon the, the peaks, um, the, the sudden spikes that occur. So establishing um, sort of like similarity of, of, of regions over significant interval of time, when in fact what we are measuring uh, and differences we're seeing is of the order of 5% and 10%. We're not seeing differences of, say, 50%, where, okay, fine, we're we are okay with very different things because, you know, um, if it varies a little bit, but if our numbers are very different, we can still make a statistically significant claim. But then, no, we are talking about things that probably vary by 5%, 10%, probably 20%. Okay, so so far I've talked about so the demand side of things, right? The order flows and then the throttling them and then selecting them and so on and so forth. Uh, there's also the supply side control, uh, the restaurant parameters, right? Uh, and I sort of hinted this earlier as well. Um, say that you, um, you, know, you, you sort of want to limit the orders, but then you want to limit them uh, in a specific way, which is, which is a function of the restaurant. Uh, leave out the restaurant customer distance for the moment, but other things. For instance, the preparation times. This was also mentioned in the earlier talk. When you when you have restaurants with high preparation times, and you have a say, or you have restaurants that have a lot of orders that are backed up, you want orders to shape away from that, right? So you can basically deprioritize those kinds of restaurants, or not take orders, or not show them at listing, um, and towards those places, or temporarily shut them down. Temporarily shut them down for like a half an hour or something, so that you can shape the demand towards restaurants with shorter preparation times. Uh, and again, you, here you need to understand and quantify the trade-off between potential order loss and increase in the delivery efficiency of the system. And the second part is uh, is very important again because again, restaurant preparation. When you when you when you do this reallocation, it not only does it ensure that um, you're having better service, it, what it again does is that your cycle time is reduced. You have shorter preparation times, so your order gets completed quickly. Your cycle time is shorter. Your delivery rate increases. So it ends up like Clearing your queue faster. Okay, so uh, then of course there is um, the heart of the thing, right? Everything that I've talked about is uh, uh, at the center of that. All of this lies uh, the assignment algorithm, right? What is the procedure that is used uh, when an order comes in to assign it to a delivery agent? Uh, what is it that we are optimizing? Right? Um, is it like, do I need to optimize for the average order to deliver time uh, being minimum? Or should I optimize for the 90th percentile of the order to deliver time being minimum? Or do I optimize for, um, say, the fraction of orders that exceeds the promised time of delivery by 10 minutes? Right? Or um, do I take a completely different approach? Um, so so, so uh, what, I don't know if, if you're sort of... Um, uh, one one common thing in the talk is that formulating a problem itself in this case is is is, is a part of the challenge, right? Um, requires significant thinking and effort. So, but then at least you know that um, the things that we need are again the preparation times. Uh, you want to know you want to be there when uh, the order is prepared, but not much earlier because then the delivery agent has to be waiting there, right? And then the restaurant to customer travel time and the time taken to travel to the restaurant itself. Once the delivery agent, delivery agent delivers an order, you need to go to the restaurant for the next order, for the next pickup. Um, then, of course, there is the batching. You, you basically batch a couple of orders 
two orders at the same restaurant, nearby customers, you want to group them together with the same DE, pick up both, deliver one, and then go ahead and deliver the second. So you can imagine, even again, without actually getting into math or anything, you just imagine how much more difficult that becomes, right? You now have to, you have two different orders. Um, when the delivery agent picks it up, both orders should be completed. And once it's picked up and sent to the first um, and, and delivered, it should be within compliance, within the, within the promise time. And then travel time to the next one, and it should again meet that requirement that it's there in, in, the, in, the, um, in the sort of promise time. And in, in some algorithms, you might want to make that assignment while the DE is still completing the earlier trip. So, so you understand the complexity of the problem. Then, of course, there's error propagation. Understand things like error propagation. How much is errors in preparation time affecting delays and decreasing delivery efficiency? Right. OK. Uh, so, um, so then there's this whole host of issues. And I've sort of addressed some of them, um, which probably some of these which seem like a repeat. Like I said, there's a lot of variability. There's a lot of stochastic uh, component to the variables that limits the predictability. And um, that's something that's there pretty much every aspect of the delivery problem. Um, and then, of course, like I said, coming up with an appropriate metric or a set of quantities that uh, will help us evaluate two comparable scenarios uh, to do some sort of an A-B testing. Um, and the other thing is that just the, not only do we not know what the sort of the global solution is, um, the methodology for the global solution, we don't know how much our solution uh, differs, deviates from the global solution. Right? If I'm talking about, say, the assignment algorithm, and I say I get some delivery efficiency with the algorithm uh, that I have, and let's say that there is some unknown oracle given sort of uh, globally optimal solution to the problem, and I not only do not know that, I also don't know how much it differs from what I currently have. Right? Um, then, of course, the challenge is running uh, carefully controlled experiments, right? Because there's like you don't want to shut off restaurants too much. Uh, you don't want to like keep changing too many of the parameters connected with it. Um, so there is obviously issues connected with not upsetting the business too much and still main, being able to run these experiments. Uh, and then, of course, like I said, to understand the effects of unexpected delays, right? What happens in those cases? Um, and in general, it's like it's it's a, it's like a system with many components, with many interacting components, and um, and where the effects sort of propagate. So it's sort of hard to disentangle exactly which one leads to what. Okay. So yeah, and that brings us to the end of the talk. And uh, thank you for your time. Questions, please. Thank you, Venki. Please raise your hands if you have questions. Yeah, over there. Let's start over there. Uh, you mentioned about inflows and outflows. Uh, oh, hey. Uh, so, do you consider order value also while you are uh, forming the strategy for throttling? Um, right. So, um, if, if, like I said, the order value, if you're doing a customer segmentation, then you need to do something like that. Uh, but yes, in that case, yes. That means you need to make a demand, you need to predict the fraction of various composition of customers that come in. Yeah. Uh, in the back over there. You can start, sir. Uh, it was a great session. Uh, really nice to know all the problems and the intuition you had about it and the way you presented. So one other thing that I would like to know is like uh, the different set of model forms that you have used and what loss functions you have uh, assumed. Like for example, uh, in some of the uh, problems, like did you take into account what is optimal for the uh, customer experience? Or did you also take into account um, revenue, which maximizes margin revenue and things like that? So from a modeling point of view and also from a business point of view, just want to yeah. get some point. Yeah, so, um, so let's sort of slightly uh, break this down, right? So. But let's let's the first part is that um, when it comes to say um, the revenue, the only way it enters into sort of the delivery calculation is when you're trying to uh, total the orders and decide 
whom to show which which customers will get access to viewing that restaurant or that region or some such thing. That's the only place so far that we've used the actual revenue information. But then the other thing is sort of more um, um, significant. The idea that what what is it that you sort of want to optimize for, right? Uh, is it customer satisfaction? Now, what is customer satisfaction? If I promise it a, del a, a, a delivery in 35 minutes, right? And if I if I took uh, 50 minutes, clearly that that is a very clear case of customer dissatisfaction. But then if I had already promised you 45 minutes, instead of, if I showed you 45 instead of 35, right? Then maybe it's not so bad. So the question is, what I promise? Should I sort of change my the time that I actually promise so that I can attain the, attain the delivery within that time? Um, or should I sort of minimize the um, overall, the average time, or say the 90th percentile of that? And typically, the focus is on ensuring that the order gets delivered within the time, or maybe within 10 minutes of the time. That tends to be the typical focus, all else being equal. But they are really not always equal, though. So. Hello, yeah. yeah. Could you please explain a little detail about the assignment algorithm? A little bit. Sure, I mean, so um, obviously I can't get into all the details, but okay, so the idea is that um, you want to um, make an assignment in such a way that um, an order comes in, you have information about, you know, say, what the promise time is. You have information about, say, um, the restaurant, something, say, it's preparation time, right? And you have information about prediction about, again, all of these are predictions, right? Uh, how much time it takes to go from the restaurant to the customer. So think about this, right? That's one simple thing is that you want the order to reach, say, in 40 minutes. And so you work backward and try and see, like, when it should get to the, when the, rest, when it, the food should be prepared so that, or when the DA should reach it so that it can reach in 40 minutes. Because you have the, you have the time for the restaurant to the customer. So you try to ensure the delivery agent gets there. But you don't want the delivery agent to get too early there because then he has to wait, right? And so you sort of send the delivery agent so that the, this gap is a minimum. That's one thing. Now imagine if you have more than one order simultaneously, you're batching the orders, right? Now the thing is you have now, the last leg is essentially the first customer to second customer, restaurant to the first customer. And so that has to both happen meeting compliance. So you have to decide which of the two orderings is better for you. And you have to also ensure that by the time you pick up, both orders are actually ready. And at the same time, you don't want to keep them waiting. So it's about co combining all of these different things. Hi. So you mentioned the delivery radius, the serviceability, serviceability yeah. Yeah. radius. So uh, how is that defined? Because I think that might uh, that might keep changing as the demand goes on, goes up. So 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 typically, what happens is that uh, the, there are some fixed parameters associated with different areas for these things. So ideally, you keep them fixed and you don't sort of ideally we don't want to tweak any of these things. But then the Everything I'm talking about is dealing with scenarios where you need to apply some real-time strategy, right? And then you're suddenly facing a surge in demand. It's reaching points where you feel like you, you sort of know, based on prior knowledge, that um, it's your serviceability uh, numbers are going to fall. So you need to throttle them. So then you sort of reduce the strength of radius. Okay. I don't know if I answered the question, any, but any maybe... Uh... Only one? Okay, let's go. Hi. Uh, apart from using the size of the delivery fleet and the average time uh, delivery agent you takes to deliver an order, do you also consider parameters like if like a very popular restaurant like Truffles or Meghna Biryani is not able to churn out that many number of orders in a small time of period of time, is that also a serviceability factor? So, so can you repeat that question again? For like very popular restaurants yeah. where there is a very very high demand from various channels, including Swiggy and other food tech companies. Yeah. Uh, is a s the serviceability factor also takes into account the capacity of them churning out those many orders? Right. So that's the thing that I um, talked about, like the supply side control. So um, yeah, we certainly like look at say the near real time, last 15 minutes, last 30 minutes preparation time at the restaurant, or more. We might use proxies like order to picked up time, right? So if it's if it's too high, then uh, we deprioritize it both like in listing, like uh, or we deprioritize it in terms of basically shutting it down temporarily. But yes, those things are uh, very much uh, part of it, especially during uh, you know some big events and stuff. Any more questions? Okay, thanks, Venkateshan. A round of applause for him, please.